school. Welcome everybody. I've been here about 12 years and it's my pleasure to give you a walkthrough of our current exhibition, which features the work of our 2020 cohort of MFA students. So every year we do the MFA thesis exhibition where the students um, showcase the work that they've been working on for the past two years while they've been here at Mills. This particular cohort graduated last year in 2020 during the midst of COVID. So when they went into shelter in place in the middle of March, it was really the middle of their last semester. So they were unable to finish the work that they had planned for the exhibition. So it's a really special thing for us to bring our alumni artists back um, to campus. Um, they had access to all of the art facilities in order to fabricate and finish their work. And then our summer exhibition has been a showcase of their work. For those of you who've been in the museum before, you'll know that the building was uh, built and designed in 1925. Um, but it's a really flexible space for contemporary work. So it's great to be able to have our students work here. And we're going to take a little tour and give you a little snapshot of what everybody's doing. Um, so our, our first artist that we'll look at is Emma Logan. Um, Emma is an artist who's very much interested in issues around environment, landscape, and agriculture. Uh, she's very much a research-based artist, um, but she's also somebody who's interested in interactive um, installations as well. So this large piece that she's created up front is one that's deliberately meant for you to touch. Um, this feels amazing, by the way. And it's, it's all wool. Um, it's all sourced from Northern California. And she's very much interested in people actually walking through the piece, um, touching the piece, and smelling the piece. So all aspects of that and how we think about um, our, our relationship to land and our relationship to food and our relationship to animals is something that she's thinking about with this work. Um, another piece that she's created, so I should say uh, this wool piece is one that she had intended to make um, last year when she was still in school, but a number of the students um, actually created brand new work um, after being in COVID and being in lockdown for the pandemic for the past year. And so this is a brand new piece that Emma conceived of during um, during the pandemic. It is related to the Beaker people. Uh, so this was a society back in um, the Bronze Age that was really responsible for cultivating and I will say co colonizing Northern Europe and England um, during that period of time. And those are actually Emma's direct ancestors so is why she's interested in this particular group of people. Um, Emma is a supremely talented ceramicist. Um, and this piece, maybe we'll get a couple of detail shots in here too, is based off of the beaker form that the beaker people were named after. So these are all ceramic beakers or pots that Emma has created. Um, back in the Bronze Age, these pots were noted for the very simple geometric, geometric decorations that were on them. So a series of dots and lines. And what Emma has done is she's created a platform with some of these decorations on them. And then she has asked visitors, and it's now partially complete at this point, to take a beaker fill it with water, and then place it on top of these panels, which are decorated with slip. So as the water evaporates, the color and pattern will absorb into the bottom of each of the beakers. And then as a, at the very end of the exhibition, she'll take all of the beakers with her and fire them. And so they'll be glazed based on the random pattern of people putting them on this space. which is cool. That's amazing. <laughs> so our next artist is Genevieve Busby. Um, Genevieve's done two projects. This entire wall is a series of collages that she created. 
uh, based off of drawings that she's done of found objects from walking up and down the beach. Um, most of these objects you can see are, are old tennis balls or old soccer balls, um, old dog toys, right, that, that get lost in the ocean and then come back onto the beach. And they're collaged onto found maritime maps. So she's trying to actually pinpoint the location of where she's found these and where they may have come from um, in time. So it's in many ways a way of kind of mapping the trajectory of these lost items and thinking about how they, how they travel and how they come back to us and in what form. Her other project is um, a project called LCD Remains. And these are, in many ways, little memorials for different kinds of LCD screens. So liquid crystal diode screen, which is the screens like in your phone or in a flat screen TV or in a touch screen. And she's taken discarded LCD screens and separated all the materials out and then cast those materials into resin crystals. So she's playing off of the term liquid crystal diode by actually memorializing them into an actual crystal. So, you know, a lot of these artists are really thinking long term about climate. They're thinking about our environment. Um, they're thinking about resources, you know, how do we use and create things, um, what happens to those objects that we take for granted in our lives, and the environmental impact um, long term that they'll have. So, our next artist is Crystal Glenn. Crystal created this enormous ramp. <laughs> <laughs> which is a site-specific piece um, built in the museum. It's really a reference to the movable walls in the museum. So we have a whole series of large-scale movable walls that we use to create our installations. And really the walls are meant to disappear so that they just become a backdrop for the art itself. Uh, but what Crystal's done is obviously turned one of these walls onto its side pushed it up against the wall, and then really made you think about exhibition space. Um, how are things built? How are things constructed? Why do these walls exist? And you're also invited to walk underneath them, behind it, so that you can actually see the structure of the wall, too. The other pieces of hers um, also have to deal with uh, building in different ways. This particular photograph um, is called Forest Number 4 Flagging SPI Plantation. Um, there are forests that are called plantations um, that where the trees are marked to be cut down. And SPI is one of the largest logging um, timber companies in the world and most of those logging sources are based here in Northern California. So again, an artist who's really interested in <clears throat> environmental issues um, and thinking about, okay, if you're going to construct something <laughs> like this ramp, where is some of the material coming from and how does that impact our environment? So it's kind of interesting to have these two pieces side by side. Um, Maybe we'll go to Esme's work. Sure. So Esme Park has created a very ambitious hanging light box sculpture with neon. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a really interesting piece. She's a really great uh, video artist as well as photographer. Um, 
the work itself is really meant to be sculptural and spatial. So each of these boxes are handmade boxes that she created. Um, they have different imagery on either side. And the work really has to do with thinking about queer bodies and trans bodies in the landscape and kind of the spiritual quality of that landscape and that relationship. So she, uh, all of these videos and photographs were taken in Iceland. So when she was here at Mills, she would go back and forth. She's not Icelandic, she's American. Uh, but she would go back and forth to Iceland because the landscape is such a magical uh, place. And so a lot of that is captured in these panoramic images um, of her own body and her partner's body in these spaces together. And then there's kind of a spiritual um, quality to it as well. So the imagery of an upside, upside down cross is something that she plays with in her work a lot. Um, and I think the kind of spiritual quality of the landscape in relationship um, to her own existence is something that she's interested in. Her, but certainly while she was here, like many students at Mills, really um, are pushed to expand what they do beyond the medium that they're really comfortable with. Um, so Luciana was very interested in thinking about the role of photography and thinking about science um, and created uh, a whole series of what she calls it's really, it's goo. Um, and she's also thinking about something called uh, space goo, which is in folklore, a kind of sticky transparent <laughs> substance that you sometimes find in the dawn on, on the grass or in the trees, which um, according to lore is coming from meteorites and falling to the ground. Um, but she's making the actual kind of classic kids goo uh, in her studio incorporating different kinds of colors, different kinds of glitters into it, and then creating cross sections of it for these images, for example. Um, so these look very much like scientific images or scientific scans or specimens. Um, but again, she's really interested in the kind of playfulness of the material um, and the color of it as well. And also just the horror. <laughs> of it too. So this is the artist herself covered in goo. Um, you know, the sense that, that there's something actually disgusting about the sliminess of, of the material itself. And then she's also expanded that into very large scale paintings that she's done too. Uh, so it was really nice she created this um, piece for the exhibition incorporating soap bubbles and different colors of dye um, and some of the, the green material on there. Uh, but the, you know, the scale of it and the imagery certainly relates to abstract expressionist painting and artists like Sam Francis, for example, um, but thinking about the use of color and especially these really saturated kind of jewel tones. So we have a few uh, of our students who created video installations for their thesis show. One of them is Hannah Youngblood. Hannah does, um, she's been working on a whole series of videos that feature herself in kind of fetish video mode. So in this particular piece, she is depicting herself as a, as a fat woman and specifically as a fat queer woman, which is how the terms that she uses to describe herself for this. And she is eating pizza. So it's a takeoff on the kind of fetish videos that you might find on YouTube or other websites. Um, and one that thinks about the history of what she calls bimbofication, which is this hypersexualized version of women um, 
doing fetishy and provocative acts in these videos. And she's really turning it on, the, on its head, thinking about, um, I think, empowerment of putting herself in that position. Um, there's a really strong sense of humor that comes through in this work that's really wonderful. And also thinking about audience and who this is for, the fact that it's in an art museum as opposed to an X-rated site or opposed to YouTube. Um, what does that mean? It, 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 it brings up different questions um, as her as a maker and where she's actually installing the work to. Um, one of our other video artists is Yutunde Agaju. Uh, Yutunde was working on a project when she was here at Bell's involving the history of Sarah Bartman. And Sarah Bartman was a South African woman who was brought to Europe in the early part of the 1800s. Um, black woman who was featured featured as really a display and as, as a scientific oddity, if you will, um, during that period. Uh, so she was shown in freak shows, she was shown in scientific labs, and there are many, many, um, not images because it's pre-photography, but drawing and other representations of her and her body. Um, so it was, she was really used by white uh, men in Europe as a sign of both misogyny and racism um, and thinking about um, how men classify black female bodies. And so Yutende is really interested in that history and what she's done in this particular piece and in one of the videos inside is she's taken a print that was done in the 1830s um, of Sarah Bartman with different individuals who are looking at her, pointing at her, and commenting on her body. And she's erased Sarah out of that image. Um, so she's trying to give agency and empowerment back uh, to Sarah Bartman when she really had none while she was alive. Um, so the video inside is um, related to this particular print and shows the hands and a little bit of the faces of these individuals. Um, again, removing Sarah's body from that injustice that she went through. And then the larger installation that's on the outside of the black box also relates to that. So Yutunde has created this very large curtain that can hold a body inside of it, um, intending to kind of shield Sarah Bartman, if you will, from crying eyes and from um, judgment and gesture. So creating a, a private space that's a stand-in and kind of a metaphor for her body. Emily Bjorma. Uh, Emily is one of the most technically proficient artists uh, I've seen here and Wells. Her, her drawing ability is really quite amazing. Um, all of the work is very political in nature, so drawings, paintings, sculptural pieces that have to do with um, a very strong feminist uh, standpoint. So she's taken the famous painting by Artemisia Gentileschi and using it to think about um, the Me Too movement, um, other, other women who have come forward to state their case about being raped. Um, the trophy head <laughs> is very much of that same ilk. Again, from a very strong feminist uh, perspective about male power and, and power dynamics and trying to change that. Um, a lot of the work is very political about our own political system as well. So um, pieces that have to do with the relationship between Trump and Putin. Um, again, you know, we just 
went through a large election in November, and this work would have been part done and created during the time of Trump's presidency as well. Um, and then brand new painting that she created um, while she was, uh, after she graduated during this past year, again, um, an artist who's really thinking about environmental justice issues as well. Um, so you know, this kind of beautiful landscape, and the closer you look, you realize what you're seeing is a, is a whale massacre. Um, so thinking again about art history as colonizers, whether it's colonizing black bodies, whether it's colonizing landscapes, whether it's colonizing other animals, um, there's an interesting kind of sub-theme and connection to the work in the show. Christine Blanco. So Christine is using very minimal um, aesthetic gestures in her work, uh, but you can see it's very much a, a front door, um, a kind of abstracted set of stairs, building blocks and bricks. Um, she's an artist, again, who's also very much interested in climate change and the impact of climate change, especially on immigrant communities. Uh, she herself um, comes from a Filipina background. Um, her grandparents still live in the Philippines, and this particular group of objects is based off of flooding that has happened in her grandparents' home. Um, so they live in an area of the Philippines that over the past 15, 20 years is continually flooded. They typically have three to four feet of water in their house at one time. And so they've actually gotten to the point where they're living constantly with water in their home and the concrete uh, for the steps and the concrete for the door is the water level that you would have found in her grandparents' home in the Philippines. And it's just become a way of life for them. And so she's documenting that, that sea change, if you will, in a very direct way. Uh, the bricks that are part of this piece were made from clay in her backyard here in Fruitvale in oh. Oakland. So um, during COVID, not having access uh, to her studio, uh, she was actually digging in the backyard and thinking about place and thinking about materials that way. One of the things that's really charming about it are the little um, footprints in the bricks themselves because she would lay them out to dry in the afternoon and at night um, raccoons would come and stuff on them. <laughs> so, very site specific. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> part of this cohort, cohort is Megan Hinton. So Megan's a painter. A lot of her work deals with collage and with found elements. Um, so she's done a series of paintings. These are two from that series that uh, deal with found elements and sports motifs. And then she's created a large-scale installation that is very much meant to be a free throw line for a basketball court. Um, but it's all using found material that was found in the painting, painting uh, studio here at No. So everything that's here is either a broken easel. So all of these are found the easels that were being thrown away because they no longer work. Um, the the goalpost um, basketball goal is is a is a easel as well. She didn't actually paint these. These are what they look like, so she's just repurposing them. But it's interesting to think, um, especially now with the transition that Mills is going through, you know, somebody wrote girl on uh, the easel there. Uh, so what did that mean um, being here at Mills during this time as well? So it's all found paintings um, 
and scraps of paintings. So these are all left over from other students and then repurposed into a stack of all court. Um, and really thinking about issues around gender, place, um, scale, and what it means to be a painter too. And then the very last piece we'll talk about is also by Emma Logan, who did the wool piece and the eager piece up front. Um, these are real almonds, so almonds in the shawl, and then milk jugs, which are uh, cast porcelain, so they're incredibly fragile. And the sack itself is meant to be kind of a minimalist um, take on issues around agriculture. So milk is one of the most, um, I think it is the most produced food product in the U.S. Um, almonds are a close second and they both take an enormous, uh, just incredible amount of water to produce, um, both nuts and, and dairy cows as well. So she's really thinking about this precarious balance that we live in, in our world, and how, how we're choosing our resources. Um, do, we, do we need to have as many almonds in our lives? Do we need to have as much uh, cow and dairy products in our lives? Um, and what does that, again, what does that mean for our environment? So, so we have a group of 10 students. Um, actually, I should say they're all alumni at this point. Um, again, we're so happy to have them come back to campus to create this body of work. Um, it's a really strong exhibition. It's really been a pleasure to have it up during the summer. Um, and I think in many ways it's, it's such a kind of spiritual journey that we've all gone on together with COVID and to see this group of alumni come out of that creating something so strong and powerful and very meaningful and pointed for our, our moment in time um, is really terrific. So thank you for taking the tour.